Hi, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm Sandy Mason with the University of Illinois Extension as the State Master Gardener Coordinator, and we are so glad you've decided to join us. This is a great time to be talking about gardening. I know I'm always so optimistic, and I know that it's gonna be a great season. Maybe you're feeling that same optimism, or maybe you're feeling like, well, last year didn't go so well, and I wanna make sure it doesn't happen again this year. Well, we are here to help you out. And we always have an ever-changing cast of characters, uh, or panelists, maybe I should say, uh, that are also here to take your questions. So, and Don, what do you have for us? Yes. My name is Don White. I'm an emeritus professor of plant pathology from the University of Illinois. And while I was at the university, I taught introductory plant pathology to students, including Sandy, uh, diseases of field crops and diseases of ornamentals and turf grasses, and did research on corn diseases, genetic resistance. And after I retired, I got kind of bored because I didn't have anything to do. So I went through the training and became a master gardener. Yay! And I, thoroughly enjoy particularly working in the hotline in the Master Gardener office. So what I have is a question on a cherry tree fungus. And this is a rather interesting uh, uh, question because the photographs are just wonderful. What they have here is they have photographs, they show the fungus, the underside of the leaf, and it is not a cherry tree, it's an <laughs> apple. And these are the Esia of cedar apple rust fungus. And so what you have is the cedar apple rust fungus. And it shouldn't be a major problem on a crab apple, which I assume this is because it probably had small red fruit and they figured it was a cherry tree. What happens is if this disease becomes a problem, the fungus overwinters on red cedar as a gall. Spores are produced and associated with that gall in the spring and then spread to the apple tree. And then uh, what'll happen if they really want to control it, what they need to do is just go ahead and put fungicides on early in the spring and it just, no problem at all. Okay, very good. And that's why we love when people send us pictures. Yes. Because it really is one of those things. Well, that photograph of the underside yeah. of that leaf is good. And then the fact that we could figure out it, it, it is indeed a crab apple and not a yes. cherry. That's So plant identification is also really important. So thank you very much, Zoe, for sending in those pictures. It helped immensely when it came to answering your question. And Jim. <coughs> This is from uh, T Timothy Smith, and he said his brother has a dark maple tree that hasn't produced leaves for several years and is staying in a small height. And he wanted to know if we had any solutions to solve the problem. Well, first of all, if your maple hasn't leaped out for several years, the odds are it's dead. So you need to start over. Uh, take it out and replant with some other tree. Or if you want the same kind of maple, you can try that. And I'm suspecting that since you said it was a dark maple that you got a Crimson King Norway maple, which has dark purple leaves. <clears throat> the thing with uh, Norway maples is they are shallow rooted and they do not tolerate being planted at all, even a few inches too deep. And so uh, that may have been why it died. So make sure that when you are planting your maple that it is at ground level for the roots, not the ball. Because a lot of times in the nursery, uh, when they're discing the field, they throw dirt against the trunk, and then that gets balled into the, uh, amazing, into the ball when you, for when you sell it. And so you need to double check the trunk and see if you can see a little flare. And that, if you don't see that, that means you've got dirt against the trunk. Kind of scrape that away until you start seeing that flare, and that's the height you're gonna wanna plant it at. Uh, and that hopefully will um, allow your tree to live. Plus the other thing is, Norways do not tolerate really wet soils either. So make sure you have good drainage. Okay, very good. Good tips too. And it, people should always check for that. I always say it looks like a little, almost like a little skirt. Because right. little, that little trunk flare, it's got to be there. So really after you plant things. So thank you very much, Jim. And Mark. Hello, my name is Mark Kemp and I'm a landscape architect and I can handle questions regarding trees, shrubs, uh, perennials, general landscape questions. Um, I have a question here sent in by Linda. Um, she asks a question of uh, a suggestion for a bright red, uh, very hardy shade tree. They live on a farm, so size does not matter in terms of overgrowing a space. Um, 
Luckily for fall color, there's lots of choices there. Red maples, red sunset maple, October glory maple are very large, um, fast growing trees that will give you a bright red fall color. Um, Autumn blaze red maple is a cross between a silver and a red that also will give you very fast growth with a bright red fall color. Um, but you don't necessarily need to limit yourself just to maples. Um, you could even uh, put in a few uh, bald cypress, even if you could find the sourwood um, or a sweet gum. Uh, all those other trees will give you other things like seed pods and stuff like that, but if it's an open yard, it won't be as much of a concern. Uh, you could even put some smaller trees in as well. As they've mentioned, Crimson King Maple will give you a burgundy uh, leaf or a crab apple will give you a purplish leaf. Um, and there are a lot of, there's several hardy crab apples too that won't necessarily have the severity of, of diseases, um, but mix it up and you'll get varying degrees of fall color and varying degrees of uh, texture and leaf and size. Okay, very good. Thanks, Mark. And I love being able to pick out trees, to have that opportunity, because yeah. you don't always feel like you have that opportunity to plant a lot of trees. So thank you very much. And uh, remember, if you want to, if you have questions for us tonight, you can certainly give us a call at 217-333-3495. But don't forget, we also have a voicemail later on, 3 o'clock in the morning, you have a burning question. You can call us on our voicemail number at 217-300-8224. And we have a caller online, too, Joe from Lovington. You have a question, I think it looks like, about uh, spraying fungicides. How can we yeah, help you? Uh, is it too early to start spraying uh, Coosa dogwoods with a fungicide? So Coosa dogwoods, spraying for fungicide. And because the issue is on the leaves or? Well, I've had the uh, fungicide or fungus just kill dogwood trees for me. It, it gets on the bark, gets on the leaves, gets on the whole plant. It just kills them. Well, there's some leaf diseases that occur on dogwood, but I don't Can't think of any know that they'd bark. ever kill them. Yeah, well, what about cankers affecting the trunk and then the leaves dying from the cankers? Well, canker diseases, I would think that it'd be difficult to find a fungicide that would right. control cankers. But I wonder, it, so we're not talking about lichens, the little, the little like greenish stuff that like grows on the bark and stuff? We're not talking about that, right? Well, it's... Uh, it actually looks like white spots that get on the bark and on the leaves. I was thinking, oh, on the bark? Okay. Yeah. I wonder if we weren't talking about lichens, so that's what I wonder. It's possibly. If it's, if it's on your bark, it's probably pretty harmless. But yeah, you'd kind of want to identify what's actually happening because just spraying indiscriminately um, is not necessarily going to solve your problem and it may just cause, you know, too, excess spraying for unnecessary means. So. Um, I guess uh, look up photos, take it in to garden center to see if it could be identified. Your master gardener program. Yeah, master gardener <laughs> program, and then uh, attack it, it with a known you know, problem. Right, right, get some good pictures, because I think this is definitely yeah. a time when pictures right. would really help immensely. And as you said, we don't want to spray Because it could be a mildew, like it, it could be a lichen, yeah. it could be yeah. various. Especially if it's on the, tr the trunk, I mean, whatever it's not lichen. So we'll see if that doesn't help you. So get some more info, or check it out, or the plant clinic for that matter is another yeah. thing you by plant clinic. So hopefully that gives you some ideas, Joe. And on line three, we have Lucille, has, uh, has a question about grapevines. On line three, Lucille? You have a question, Lucille, on line three? Hello? Yes, hi, how are you? You have a question about grapevines? Yes, uh, I have a grapevine that's maybe 45 years old. It looks like it's uh, starting to die out on me, and I would like to know if there's a way that I could get a start off of it before oh. it dies. Uh, they're awfully sweet, and uh, I've had them for a long time. Uh, any suggestions how I would root a uh, starting off of it. So propagating uh, grapevines. Well, first of all, I'd like to know if you've ever been pruning it. Uh, like they're recommending to uh, keep them vigorous and healthy. If you haven't been uh, pruning them properly or at all, then you may want to consider that first. And then while you're pruning, then you can get some of the cuttings for rooting. So I think you can take cutting, can't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've I never tried that before, but... Um, you might want to get some root tone mm -hmm. at a garden store. And have you ever pruned it? Has it been pruned? Sounds like we're hearing maybe maybe you've got your TV on in the background. It's kind of hard to understand. Sometimes <laughs> I know. Yeah. So so maybe maybe just sort of might want to go ahead and uh, maybe get a cutting 
right. off of it. I think that would, like you would with a lot of other plants. So I think yeah. that'll probably yeah. work fine. And I would try and figure out also what is causing that one to kind of decline as well. Because mm -hmm. you want to, you want it as healthy as possible when you take that, that cutting, but you know, what is causing it to, to not flourish and maybe it needs to be planted in a different area or maybe it's too wet or something like that. Okay, well hopefully that gives you some ideas. And on line four we have Bill from Springfield and you have a question about, oh, it sounds like it's maple night. You have a question about sugar maples? Yeah, I had a 22, 23 year old sugar maple, nice looking tree. It all of a sudden, in the, in the, like in the middle of the summer, the end of summer, it just dropped all of its leaves way, way early. We, mm. uh, I typed, we typed in on the, we Googled it, and it said uh, leaf drop sugar maple was a petiole wasp. I waited a couple years, and uh, the tree was dead. I made sure t to get rid of all the leaves under that it, that it dropped. I never let them sit there long. I blew them all across the road, and I just wondered what, <laughs> what killed my sugar maple. Yeah, I don't think petiole wasp would have probably no. done no. that much damage, but... Plus, the blowing the leaves across the road is not sanitation. <laughs> <laughs> but so what, are, what might be some options? Well, because one thing it'll get sugar maples is verticillium wilt. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And verticillium wilt will kill sugar maples. In fact, it's, yep. it gets those and a lot of red bud and things. Uh, you can kind of tell it's verticillium. Uh, get twigs the size of your thumb or bigger. Cut them into it with a knife, and you should see streaks of either greenish color or brownish color and that's uh, that's pretty good indication it's verticillium wilt. The bad news is you can't plant another maple in there for at least 10 or 15 years or red bud or a number of things so you need to get some twigs cut into them see if you got the streaks. If you do that's yep. not going to help otherwise you might have armillary root rot that'll kill the trees and we had some drought stress years that might have led to that and then, then you could replant trigger maple. So would it be a good idea maybe for them to either take a sample to their U of I extension office or the plant clinic? This that is definitely one of those times where you don't want to you don't yep. want to plant a tree that's susceptible to verisilium mm, yep. in the exact same spot. And there's a right. bunch of them that actually get verisilium, oh, right? Yeah. Other oh, trees yeah. that get verisilium. So they would be able to test for the pathogens in that. In your case, all the leaves. So that's going to be a root or leaf. I mean, the whole tree is basically being attacked by something in a sense. So the wasp is ruled out pretty quickly because it's not necessarily going to affect all the tree. So yeah taking it into the plant clinic yeah. and having them Might do be tissue it. samples, um, testing. So. Make sure you get some decent sized branches, thumb and bigger. You know, one time though, I did see when I was first <laughs> in extension, aphids totally defoliate a 50 foot sugar maple. Okay. Wow, wow. I mean, they were thick, I mean, but then with that many aphids, everything's sticky under the tree. Right, so if you right, don't have any right. stickiness, then you can forget the aphids but too. It sounds like the branches started to die on yeah. this one too though, right? So, because mm -hmm. aphids typically the branches no. wouldn't die, right? It, it would look fully. dramatic, certainly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Okay. Good. And then on line five, William, it sounds like you have a question about spraying apple trees. What can we do for you, William? Yes, uh, I was wondering, is it too early to spray my apple trees with the dormant oil spray, and do I just spray the trunk, or do I try to get it on the twigs and the branches and everything? Okay, good question. I think a lot of people may have that. So what's the timing on mm -hmm. dormant sprays on apple what, trees? What are you trying to control? Uh, I'm just trying to do what the old guy next to me. <laughs> he has the best apples, <laughs> and he always sprays his with the dormant oil spray. And I don't know what it kills. I was reading the label, and there's, there's several different things. But, yeah. you know, um, he always does it, and he has great apples. <laughs> so... So some thoughts? I'm thinking you're probably too early right now. I'd wait till you start to see the buds swell. Uh, and, and drumming oil is for insects and it won't, you're yep. not looking at diseases. Oh. Yeah. Cause, so typically probably what we'd see on apples, it'd be things like apple, some of the disease issues. Yeah. Probably want right. some of the big things. Right. Or, or codling moth might be another yeah. one. Or and that would be a later on a scale spray problem. too. Right. Pardon? Unless there's a scale problem. Right, unless there's scale. So that's when dormant yeah. oil might mm -hmm. be a good one. So, so that's another time. Then maybe to sort of figure out what problems you actually are having and then decide if, if you really is something you need to do. I mean, I, under, I totally understand if, if the neighbor's doing it. It yeah. seems to be good. Why And why it may change? be other reasons. It may ha he may have a different variety than you. Right. Yours might be need pruning to open it up a little bit uh, to produce a certain, a larger fruit. Um, so there, there might be other factors other than that. 
Okay, well, hopefully it gives you some ideas. I'm sure there's a bunch of people thinking about their apple trees now. So we're going to go ahead and do our other email questions. So, Don. What I have a question? show and tell. I think that's coming up next. Uh, it's wet wood or slime flux, and it's occurring. Uh, the photographs I've got are on uh, elm. This is Chinese elm. You can see those white colored stripes running down out of uh, where branches have been cut off. This is caused by a bacteria that gets inside the heart of the tree. It starts to break down sugars and other compounds. It actually causes fermentation. And you'll get a uh, buildup of s sugary, soft, oily, stinky stuff. And it comes out the holes in the tree and goes down the side. At one time, the control was to put these pipes in the side, which I thought were kind of neat. I'd hate to walk into one. <laughs> and that's been shown to be not all that necessary. Okay, so no pipes. <laughs> no pipes. I wouldn't want to try to run one of those through a chipper. So anyway, uh, the reason why I even wanted to use this for show and tell, I was in the uh, Master Gardener Hotline office this summer, and somebody walked in with uh, photographs of this on a, a res American elm resistant mm -hmm. to Dutch elm disease, and the tree was maybe three inches in diameter. And I really took a lot to contain my excitement about it because they were feeling rather sad. They were going to cut it down, and I was kind of hoping they'd give me a piece of it. But <laughs> This, uh, this disease usually is not considered much of a problem, but it is kind of a, a nuisance in terms of smell. So there really isn't anything you can do there for it once you can it do happens. About it. No. Okay, 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 very good. But always an interesting thing to think about. Okay, and Jim. <coughs> this person wants to know if it's too late to prune oak trees. Uh, no, uh, as long as your buds have not swollen and are showing any green between the scales. So look at your twigs, and I don't, I don't mean just one. Look at several twigs on each side of the tree to check for the swelling of the buds. And if you see any green between the scales, now oh, you're pushing your luck. Uh, because there are some diseases that tend to attack the oaks as the bud scales start to uh, lower, the bud swells, and the scales start pulling apart. So you don't want to be pruning them because you help spread the disease. So, yeah, if it's totally dormant, go ahead. The good thing with oaks is, it, you know, they're so late to leaf out. Right. So usually we have a little bit of extra window of opportunity to prune oaks. So good. Good question. Okay. And Mark? Okay. I have a question here from Dave and Decatur. Um, is it too early to transplant hardy plant, uh, hardy shrubs, hardy perennials? Um, uh, and the answer to that would be no for most everything. Um, most perennials and shrubs are going to be forgiving if you can get a nice size root system dug and then pre-dig pre your hole and then mulch afterwards. Um, the only thing you want to guard against is if you really want a full display of flowers, if it's ready to flower soon after, then you're going to put it through, through some stress and you're going to have, a, I guess, a less effective flowering. But it's still going to be okay if you take care of it after the transplant. But you want to get a root ball large enough that it'll keep those roots intact, but not too large that they'll break and pull apart. Um, it's always beneficial to dig where you're going to put it, that way you can quickly put it in the ground mulch afterwards to conserve moisture and then water thoroughly like every two to three days early on and then stagger that out as needed later. Um, okay, great, yeah. great. I, I love springtime because then you can start moving everything around, yeah. dividing things and giving them to your friends. It's a great time. Okay, great. So thank you very much. And on line two we have Janice from Gilman and you have a question about rhubarb. Yes, I would like to know if rhubarb is, if it's mowed off and cut down all the greens gone off of it, and horseradish it's it's been cut down too it will it come back the next year okay if it's mowed down i i assume it grew it had a chance to grow some sounds like it yeah sounds like yeah. it so yeah i would say it'd yeah. come back yeah, I mean, they tend to die down naturally, so they should come back, yep. whether you mow it off or, unless you mow it off too early in the summer yeah, and they wore out their energy. But right, if you waited until yeah. they had started dying back in the fall and then they got mowed off, they should be back. Right. If it was right. a one-time mowing, probably a little, little <laughs> stress, but if you mowed it all year long, yeah, you basically What What if this was an that. issue with a partner or spouse yeah. that kind of mowed something they weren't supposed to be mowing? Maybe that was it, but <laughs> yeah. But we always want those perennials to just die down naturally and then, and then clean them up or whatever if we yeah. can. So that's always a good thing. Okay, great. And on line three, we have Tom from Gibson City and you have a question about grapevines. How can we help you, Tom? Uh, which one are you supposed to plant the grapevines north and south east and west 
<laughs> Which way are you supposed to plant them? North or south, east and west? I've seen them both ways, commercially. Yeah. I would almost think, I guess I always think about planting them like north and south because then you, they get the morning sun, the afternoon sun, but I don't know if that's necessarily... I, apply. I don't know, is there a old wise tale that says to do it one way or Or old another? husband's tale yeah. to yeah. do it one way or the other? Yeah, I don't now. Know. <laughs> I threw it wise. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, so I, I guess that would be my thought. I don't know that there's a tried and true that you're supposed to do it that way, but I guess that would be my first thought for anything. Yeah. To do I mean, you, 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 some of the Whatever works, commercial art, and you'll actually see some of the grapevines follow a curve around the hill, too. Yeah, so I don't know how much it matters right. too terribly much, uh, as long as they're far enough apart that they're not yeah. shading each other. If you have more than one row, that's probably the biggest thing. You just want to make sure that they get plenty of... Yeah, you know, if you have the choice, I'd say north-south, but... Other than that, I would just pick the best location in your lawn. Okay, very good. Okay, good. And then, uh, Don, I think you have another uh, Yes, I do. First. I got a question on crab apple jelly. We got somebody that is making crab apple jelly, but the crab apple tree have all died from cedar apple rust, which I find to be amazing. We've had two cedar apple rust questions <laughs> at one time. Uh, I would doubt that cedar apple rust has killed the apple because uh, it's usually not severe enough. Apple scab could make it look like it's dead right. and they'll come back in the spring. So I would suspect that what you wanna do is you wanna wait, hopefully you haven't cut the tree down, wait and see if it comes out this year. You may wanna consider going into a fungicide spray schedule uh, and go from there. If you know the variety of apple, you can look, there's websites, uh, Morton Arboretum, Minnesota has one that'll tell you what they're susceptible to and you can always send specimens of leaves into the plant disease clinic or a master gardener or extension office. So first thing you wanna do is that's what the problem is. Uh, if you're gonna try to figure out which apples are the best, I would go first with resistance to apple scab, probably second with resistance to fire blight, and then I'd worry about cedar apple rust. Okay, okay. And I don't think people always realize it, how big, you know, crab apples, you know, typically we like the little bitty crab apples because, you know, usually it's a lot less mess, but they're obviously making crab apple jelly, so they probably might even want yeah. some of the bigger ones because I think, don't they go up to like two inches and yeah. still be called a and crab And they might apple? have one of the older variety. Yeah, well, and it could have an older variety. But right? now, if they have quince rust on that hawthorn, that does go after the fruit, yeah. doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, so, so that, that could be a quality be a issue if you're trying to make a crab apple jelly. Right. But I, I mean, if you're just looking at it, big like deal. It. But if you're making the jelly, the rust, and the, I mean, you'll st you'll see um, something going on, uh, you know, and this doesn't die. You should see some kind of growth on that fruit. Been great to have pictures or okay. a little bit more right. description. Okay. Okay. Very good. Good one. And on line two, we have Alice from uh, Mount Zion. Looks like you have a question about silver maples. How can we help you? Yes, my silver maple is huge, and it's beautiful, but it's like 120 years old. Oh, wow. And how long do they live? 120 I'm, years? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm I've never seen yeah. one that old. They yeah. rot and fall down before that. Uh, yeah, it just comes down to what damage they would take on. They're really soft-wooded, so in storms they can, they can break out and cause scarring and wounds, and that usually then contributes to decay and other problems. So if it's avoided most of those and it seems healthy i don't know how long it can go yeah. uh, obviously it's a very happy plant where right. it is because yeah. it's is lasted it near that the, long is it near a house or another structure yes it is uh, i'd be a little bit concerned then it's really yeah. yeah it just comes down to then the risk of it you okay. know because it yeah. is soft wooded and the branching angles aren't always the greatest so it's always potentially going to have breaking. So, so maybe get a professional arborist to come out, just take yeah. a, evaluate it, that kind of thing, give you some ideas, doesn't necessarily mean it has to come okay. down. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Good for you though, for having a 120 year old silver maple, that's fabulous. Right. And on line three, we have Anne from Champaign, and it looks like you have some hosta issues, Anne. I do, I had hostas that had been growing beautifully along my screened in porch for three or four years, and uh, last year, in mid-season, the leaves all started turning brown, and it's been so long, I don't remember all the details, but they turned brown and just died. Oh, the wow. plant didn't die, but the leaves The died. leaves died, okay. Well, Thoughts? I know of two things that make hosta leaves turn brown. If it's on the edge, um, basically the edge moving inward is probably drought stress, because they do dry out. 
if it's spotting all over, it may be starting more at the tip where the rain may run down to the end of the leaf and sit there for a while, you may have anthracnose. So you're going to have to get an idea of what the symptoms look like. So if you're getting the whole edge of the leaf all the way around, browning in, then you're in drought stress, you need to consider watering the ground around them, not the foliage, so you minimize the effect of anthracnose. And anthracnose does like okay. watering, so okay. overhead watering, things like that. So that would be definitely a plant clinic question, I would think. Mm -hmm. Maybe if it happens again, certainly. Okay, okay, very good. And I'm afraid we're running out of time. We just don't have an, and, and, and I know Lois from Catlin, I'm sorry, we just don't have quite have time. You have a question about your walnut tree, but I will tell you, you can certainly ask us the question on our voicemail. Um, so just give us a call at 217-300-8224 and ask us that question. And certainly if anybody else, if you have questions for us that, that we can do on our podcast or on the show or even through Facebook or whatever, there's lots and lots and lots of ways to connect with us as you have questions, because I know we all have questions, right? So uh, check out our podcasts and uh, really get a, get a chance to get outside, get, some, get an opportunity to see what's starting to grow in the garden. I know I'm excited to see everything popping out of the ground. It's such a great time to be a gardener. Have a great week gardening.